H, which is the sales tax initiative that was put on the ballot and uh, creates about $355 million a year for the county of Los Angeles. And it is designed to hopefully end homelessness in 10 years because it's the life of that uh, sales tax is 10 years. Uh, it funds a lot of different things and uh, some people are concerned that it may be putting too much money here and not enough, not enough money there. Uh, we'll talk about some of that tonight. Uh, we'll start off uh, with Christian Cruz who was with, he used to be with the city of Pasadena as a field rep for uh, John Kennedy. So if you if he looks familiar, there's a reason for that. Uh, I looked at his resume, and he's very steeped in uh, San Gabriel Valley. So that's kind of a nice balance. We have a couple of other speakers from uh, LA. Uh, General uh, Dovin will be sitting in for Stephen Diaz from LA Can. He is also an organizer and uh, his main areas of concentration are in human and civil rights organizing. He's very uh, focused on the police and homelessness. So he will give Ellie Penn's uh, perspective on uh, the funding. The idea tonight is to get a good base in the funding because a number of us will be monitoring how it's actually implemented over the next few months and years. So, uh, and then we have Adam, uh, who used to, Adam Murray, who used to be with the ACLU local chapter on our board of directors, and he is now the executive director of uh, the Inner City Law Center in Skid Row. And he works very closely with L.A. Penn, and uh, some of the things that they do are very exciting. So. Uh, we'll start off with Christian, uh, but I want you to know that there is being circulated a uh, petition or, or information gathering for anyone who's interested in economic justice issues uh, and who lives in, in or about this area because we'd like to get your information and get some idea as to what kinds of economic justice issues you're interested in. So if you could fill that out for us, we'd really appreciate it. So let me turn it over to Christian. Uh, again, my name is Christian Cruz. I am with the San Diego Valley Council of Governments. We're a joint powers authority uh, that represents all 31 cities in the San Diego Valley, including Pasadena. Uh, I am tasked with our homelessness committee. Uh, we meet monthly. Uh, we've been, it's a new committee that started last July, actually, we meet here this coming month or this coming on um, next June session. Uh, and so part of the homelessness committee uh, work plan was to develop uh, an idea of how to implement in our how to implement measure H uh, as we start uh, we, as it was put on the ballot and we realized that this is something that's going to be coming to fruition uh, this year. We wanted to get ahead of it and so one of the uh, things that we did was kind of organize our committee to think about its implementation, how it's going to affect the San Diego Valley, and in particular how it's going to affect uh, San Diego Valley cities. And so I just kind of want to give you a background in terms of Measure H and what it actually uh, does and what strategies it's going to be uh, funding. Uh, so with that, so the Los Angeles County uh, strategies to combat homelessness, there's about 46 uh, strategies from the homeless initiative, uh, and there's about uh, seven categories of criminal strategies. Only 21 strategies are going to be funded through Measure H funds uh, from each one of these categories. And they go uh, from preventive homelessness to uh, subsidized housing. Uh, they, they cover many aspects of it. And so the 21 strategies that are going to be funded are at least one from each one of these categories. So a uh, strategy overview. So the strategies that are going to be covered are strategy A1, homeless prevention program for families. A5 homeless prevention program for individuals. B1 provides subsidized housing to homeless disabled individuals. B3 partner with cities to expand rapid rehousing. B4 facilitate federalization of federal housing subsidies. Uh, B2 
B7 interim uh, rich housing flows existing institutions. Uh, B6 family reunification housing. C2 increased employment for homeless adults. C4, 5, and 6 county wide supplemental security income and veterans benefits. And D2 expand jail in reach. D7 provides services and rental subsidies for permanent supportive housing. Countywide outreach systems, uh, E7 strengthening the coordinated entry system, E8 enhanced the emergency shelter system, E14 enhanced services for transition age youth. Uh, D7 provides services and rental subsidies for permanent supportive housing, countywide outreach, or actually, yeah. uh, D4 regional integrated reentry networks, criminal record clearing project, uh, public project, subsidized employment for homeless adults, and F7. Preserve current affordable housing and promote the development of affordable housing for homeless families and individuals. Um, and so, as soon after the uh, Measure H was uh, passed in March, uh, a planning group was convened involved 50 members of COGS, service providers, uh, people with the experience, faith organizations. Uh, the COGS, each, uh, our COG had two representatives uh, one from the city of Claremont, Joe Lyons, and one from the city of Pomona, the Delari. And so the discussion was how are these strategies going to be funded and how much is going to be allocated to each one of the 21 strategies. And so the group went through uh, quite a few of them and I wanted to provide you kind of a detailed, it's kind of hard to see here, but this is how the breakdown was for one of the strategies in terms of financial years, so how much is going to be allocated per financial year, what it actually does, what's going to be paid for, and uh, how it's going to continue forward over the next few financial years. What's going to happen is they uh, implement, they provided feedback, or the group provided feedback in terms of how much money should be allocated for each one of these strategies depending on, on its uh, priority. And so they came back with a, a budget that was a whole budget, so it's $355 million uh, a year that would be uh, funded uh, through Measure H. However, based on the financial year, the first financial year that's coming up, there was about $450 million that was to be allocated. But that doesn't cover the 355. So the homeless initiative came back with a balanced budget and they provided new numbers. And so they basically went through these strategies one by one over uh, five um, meetings. One of which was an all-day meeting that was added because the strategies uh, weren't detailed enough for our um, partners. Uh, the San Gabriel Valley COG um, represents all 31 cities and our view was that cities should get allocation. It is an LA County uh, tax measure. Uh, you, myself, uh, everybody's paying into this uh, tax. And so we didn't want to see it just be allocated within a certain uh, area, such as the downtown LA Skid Row. All our communities have homelessness, whether it's one, whether it's 100. And we want to make sure that that money was uh, provided back to our communities. And so we advocated um, heavily to make sure that money was allocated. Within the strategies, it wasn't detailed that cities were going to be provided money. In fact, um, the way it was uh, designed is service providers would be uh, required to give uh, information as to how the money was going to be utilized, and it would have to go uh, at least meet one of the strategies in terms of what they were going to be doing with that money. Cities were going to be able to partner with those service providers to um, uh, provide some kind of grant um, application and then be able to get that money that way. The COG did submit a, uh, a, some comments to the San Diego, um, to the homeless initiative in LA County. So, one of the comments is the coordinated, coordinated entry system serves as a heart and soul of the county homeless initiative and the means through which Measure H will realize the vision of LA County that effectively protects homeless in real time. The success of any given strategy in Mass Bolta sets seamlessly integrated community based and regionally centered continuum of care and similarly organized coordinated entry system. There's a critical element missing that will prevent achieving the mission of realizing the vision of monumental opportunity, namely the intentional engagement of local governments and regional government organizations as partners in this effort. And so while the Measure H strategies uh, talk about cities being engaged, the funding wasn't uh, there for them. And so we advocated strongly that at least some portion of some allocation be provided based on a uh, formula either uh, total amount of homeless within the region um, or other other aspects. But at the very least, money should be coming back to our city, similar to a measure M, in which transportation monies are going to be coming to certain uh, municipalities. So that was one of our comments. Uh, our next comment 
comments um, was in reference to the recognition of the need for resources to build the capacity of local service providers and community-based organizations. There is no such recognition or support of a role for local governments. The San Diego Valley Council of Governments submitted the following recommendation for putting allocations under strategy E7. Allocate a portion of Measure H funds to be used uh, to allow interested cogs to hire, create an in-house cog homeless coordinator to help expect capacity and facilitate formation with regional member cities. And cog homeless coordinator will coordinate and engage cog member cities, regional service providers in the spot, our spot would be spot three in the San Diego Valley. Uh, to support the coordinated entry system and the continuing care services for residents uh, currently homeless and those who are at risk of becoming homeless. The reason we were advocating for a homeless coordinator is because many of our cities don't have an appointed person for homelessness. And so we wanted to provide someone uh, that they could go to, that they could coordinate with homeless services and the county. It's kind of uh, adding a, a layer to, to the COG, and, or to, to a COG. And so what you would have to LA County Lost uh, and other LA County uh, uh, departments, uh, Department of Health Services. And so we wanted to make sure that the COG has someone that could speak to them, for, uh, get information, and get that back to the communities that need it. So, if, say, for example, the city of Pasadena or the city of Zuza needed help with a uh, re entry system or funding for that, the homeless coordinator would provide feedback on that information and provide kind of an avenue to the county and how to best uh, get those funds. And so this coordinator is designed, um, we hope, to really bring together the 31 communities and have a singular voice to combat homelessness. So that the city of Pomona and the city of Pasadena aren't doing the same thing over and over, whereas they can combine and collaborate to really uh, combat homelessness. And that was our intention with this coordinator. Uh, this was actually not funded and under the original strategies. And so we had discussions with the county and discussions with the homeless initiative who oversees um, the, the strategies. And uh, we were able to have an amendment uh, produced by Barger and Solis at a uh, June 13th meeting that allowed for $2 million to be, at, uh, to be allocated to the COGS and to cities for, for coordination and planning. Uh, uh, we just met with them on July 5th, and $500,000 are going to be allocated to all the COGS. So it's going to be split uh, depending on how many uh, municipalities are within each one of the COGS. The San Diego Valley Cog is going to be allocated $158,000 to hire a coordinator, uh, executive level coordinator to work with cities on um, grants, things like that. Uh, and then it, it goes all over depending on how many you would have for COGS. So the smaller COGS would get about $30,000 to um, pull together and they can hire someone for coordination. Uh, the other aspect to that is cities allocation. And so we, have, we did allocate heavily for cities to get allocated some portion of money for planning. And so depending on uh, how many homeless you would have in the community, you would get $100,000 for 100 uh, homeless or less. Uh, between uh, 100 to 300 homeless, you would get approximately $50,000 for planning. And uh, anything about 400 uh, homeless individuals within your community, you would be eligible for $70,000 in funds for planning. And so this is uh, the, these are going to be monies that are going to be uh, distributed based on grants. And so any city that is interested in these monies is going to be able to submit a grant uh, application. And it's not going to be competitive in the sense that if I submit money, I'm going to take away from another community. If there's a need for uh, for each city to have that money, the county is comfortable going back to the board of supervisors requesting additional funds for these communities. So in this way, we, we fought and got direct allocation for the cities should they desire to go after that money. Um, so that was one, one comment that when we submitted it, we weren't too sure if it was going to come back to our communities or not. But it, it worked out in, in a way that we were pretty happy about it at this point. And we hope to expand that uh, pool of money to, uh, for our cities to continue to expand their capacity to answer um, their issues. Uh, the next one is the county excluded consideration of cities as evidence in Strategy 6 in which the Sheriff Department will, receive, will be receiving $1.24 uh, million dollars, uh, per year for, homeless task, uh, for the homeless task force. The Sheriff Department provided no homeless interactions in the incorporated cities with their own police departments and no other local law enforcement agency would be receiving similar funding. Considering cities' uh, police departments have increased their spending to deal with homelessness, it is important to include within the six funding uh, for local uh, departments. Uh, so that was part of our comment letter as well. And the good thing about this, there was also an additional motion at the Board of Supervisors 
that is going to allow funding for local law enforcement uh, as well. So city law enforcement should, they need the money to, uh, pro, to put together a task force and have uh, either a sergeant or someone specifically uh, for homeless uh, this issues and, and to be able to go out there and, and do a little bit more homelessness, uh, they're going to be able to uh, get those funds as well. And we thought it was urgent because most of the time uh, police officers are the first line of defense in terms of homeless. They interact with them on a daily basis. And so to have uh, these police departments have, uh, have funds to conduct these task forces and, and to really not arrest people, but try and find a way to help them uh, find housing, find supportive housing, uh, find services, is really what the issue was. Uh, it's not a criminalizing, it's really decriminalizing the issue and making sure that uh, people that are homeless aren't being just arrested, but they're actually being helped by the law enforcement. And so that, that was our, our, one of our other comments. Um, another one uh, within our comment there was the organizational infrastructure that exists within the continuum of CARES, the COCs, as well as collaborative between the county, collaboration between the county and the COCs are critical to delivering effective and relevant homeless prevention services, consistent with the strategies outlined in Measure H. So there are three continuum of CARES. It's uh, the city of Long Beach, the city of Pasadena, and the city of Glendale. And they uh, basically run their own homeless services. They have their own money coming in from HUD that basically uh, provides within their region. Um, so under the strategies, the COC, those three COCs weren't going to be getting any money uh, through Measure H, even though their communities are paying into the, to, into the tax. So uh, Bill Wong, who's the city of Pasadena housing director, uh, and the city of Mendel and the city of Long Beach advocated successfully for additional funds and allocation to be given to the COCs so that they can expand their capacity and make sure that they're able to um, uh, uh, continue the, the downturn in terms of homelessness. Uh, Pasadena was really successful in bringing, uh, I believe, the homeless numbers over the last few years from 1,500 down to almost 400, uh, which is kind of a big deal. So. I think we're successful and Bill Wong was successful in getting these funds allocated as well. And we're talking about $355 million a year uh, compared to $2 million and then an additional, I believe, was another million dollars allocated for each of the COCs um, per COC. Uh, you know, it really does go a long way to continue the effort to minimize homelessness with this, within the San Diego Valley. Um, and so I just kind of want to give you an overview in terms of what the COG did uh, as we kind of transitioned through this whole process. Uh, I think we've been successful in advocating uh, cities uh, get allocations and not only the cause of uh, our coordination efforts. But we wanted to make sure that Measure H is a success because it, it is a 10-year measure and in 10 years uh, it's in the sunset. And if we can't show that homelessness has been uh, significantly reduced and there's been uh, a huge amount of effort and and money thrown at the, at the problem and there's nothing to show for it, uh, then it's a failure on the county's end. It's a failure of our community uh, at that point. And so we wanted to make sure that the county had every uh, bit of success, and that's engaging communities, uh, intentional uh, engagement of communities, which wasn't in their original uh, funding uh, strategies. And so I think we have successfully advocated for that. Uh, it remains to be seen how we uh, kind of roll this out. But I think we have a uh, good position moving forward over the next three to four years to see what we need to do with the coordinator, what we need to do with city uh, planning efforts, and if we need to expand it and provide them additional resources, or if we need to contract and say that this isn't working, we need to uh, utilize that money in, uh, in a different manner. And so um, I just want to say thank you very much for having me here tonight, and if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Thank you for making that presentation. Um, so you, you began your presentation by saying that the work that you're doing effectively prevents homelessness in real time. And I think that's wonderful. That's what we all want. We want a prevention of homelessness. But then the majority of your presentation was focusing on the amount of funding that's been allocated to each of the COGS. Um, how small the COGS get $30,000, $500,000 allocated to each COG depending on the percentage of homelessness in the general region. 
And it almost sounded as if the cause are being rewarded for the number of homelessness. Now, I know that that's not your intent. I know that's not. I'm just saying that that is how it comes across. If you look at the majority of the words you use, the majority of the words that you use talk about how these cogs are getting funded. I want to hear about how you intend to effectively prevent homelessness in real time. And what measures are going to be used to determine whether or not the tactics that you're using are effective. No, uh, thank you very much for that um, um, comment and question. So the cops aren't actually being funded based on homelessness. Uh, they're being funded based on the member cities within each one of those cops. And so we have 31 cities. We're the largest cop in the state of California. So we're going to get funded in a certain amount, depending on the formula. Who's going to be uh, funded by uh, homelessness is individual cities. So if a city has uh, 100 or less, they would get uh, be eligible for $30,000 worth of funding. And so I wanted to uh, make that clear, first of all. Um, in terms of real-time um, uh, in terms of real-time uh, combating homelessness, which is what the COG is going to be doing, uh, is really why we're utilizing money for a coordinator. And so the coordinator uh, realistically would um, go out to a community and ask what services do they need coming into their community, either from the county or either from the local regional area. And so the coordinator would find uh, eligible funds for those service providers or for the city to uh, implement planning in terms of permanent supportive housing, uh, in terms of uh, wraparound services either within a housing facility or, and one of the aspects we're looking at is housing as well in the sense of locating places that are potential uh, areas for development of housing for homeless individuals well, as a permanent supportive housing area. So for example, the city of Pasadena just built a permanent supportive, uh, permanent supportive housing facility here. Uh, beautiful. Uh, you would never think it, it is for permanent supportive housing. The problem is it's really difficult to build those kinds of uh, facilities because a lot of uh, people aren't educated on what that actually means. Uh, it's not so much that a uh, homeless individual is going to be picked up from somewhere and just put it into housing. It's more they have to go through a process to get into housing. They have to go through a series of, of, um, of steps just to get there. And so they're not taken away from the community. And in fact, I believe they're adding value to the community by doing that. And so our coordinator is going to be tasked with finding those types of developments or areas with each one of the, our cities to house uh, individuals within those communities, whether they're veterans or whether they're, uh, or anybody else for that matter, including youth. And so in terms of real time, that, that's what the coordinator is going to be doing um, from the cost specifically. It's really to engage communities, engage our local law enforcement, and seeing how best to get services to these individuals. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is General Joe Gow, once again. I'm born and raised on Skid Row. Civil Rights Organizer with the Los Angeles Community Action Network on Skid Row right now. Just real quickly, a spot on uh, LA Can. Uh, LA Can is a grassroots, community-based, fight back organization on Skid Row. Been there about 17 years now. Uh, three primary areas of work is uh, community organizing. Uh, we believe in not only organizing residents on Skid Row, but we organize residents out of the South Central and Watts and around the bottom. We believe that we have to organize the whole city and all the poor folks together in order to win this fight. Uh, next thing we do is leadership development. Uh, we believe in critical education. We believe that uh, all our members and everybody uh, that's going through these struggles should be um, well conversed on what the issue is, uh, why uh, certain things are happening in them, and what they can do about it, what their, their choices are. Uh, we also do work around um, policy. Uh, so uh, it's not just enough to just talk about it, but we be about it. You know, that's our model. We don't talk about it, we be about it. Uh, so we can talk all day long, but if we ain't changing no policy, we ain't doing nothing, right? And so um, uh, one of the things we do is fight to change policy. And so um, we did a lot of work uh, around both uh, Triple H, the city brand as first, and, and we did work around um, um, Measure H. Uh, the work we did, we did it on uh, Skid Row and South Central and around about. Uh, 
Uh, we did Capson, we did Doorknock, we did Phone Banking, uh, and we did GOTV, and we did uh, Political Education for GOTV Education, right? Uh, we, uh, uh, we, we, we just like I said, we did, we did both. We did Measure H and Triple H. And uh, we also fought, right, currently fighting right now uh, to get one of our members uh, on the uh, oversight committee of uh, Triple H, right, because uh, we seriously understand and know that moving forward with Measure H, you know what I'm saying, I mean, one way to ensure that funds go into where they, they're supposed to be going and people who are really getting off the streets, uh, we need some real community oversight, we need some real oversight. And so um, we're working currently right now to uh, get on the Triple H oversight, because uh, currently right now the city has the whole panel in place with either business folks, uh, homeless haters, or gentrifiers. Right? And so, um, uh, yeah, and so um, that's some of the work you know, that we're doing right now. Uh, uh, measure 8 is still you know, in its planning process, you know, and uh, we'd love to have a part of uh, Measure 8. You know, say we worked on it, so we want to see that uh, uh, people, that, that the money, you know, do go to get people off the streets. So when you look at our community and where we at, we have the highest concentration of homelessness in the nation. And so um, I got to walk in and go to work every day. I live on the block. I'm there all the time. And so, you know, um, it's really a, a dear thing not only to me, but to all of our staff members. Uh, we, uh, throughout the history, um, LA can we fought uh, the housing preservation artists uh, against the city and the housing authority, and we won. Uh, the largest housing preservation ordinance in the history of Los Angeles that preserved what little uh, low income and affordable housing the city has left. And so when we won many injunctions against police, uh, we was involved in the Tony LeVan uh, case that uh, currently have uh, injunctions on police right now on Skid Row and Roundabout that's uh, preventing them from uh, illegally confiscating and destroying homeless people's property. Uh, we've been involved in the homeless fight uh, since we since the organization started. Uh, so you know I can go on and on and on talking about things that you know we did, a lot of the victories that we did. But I'm here tonight just to talk about Measure 8, you know, answer some questions.
I would want anybody who could to help them get off the street, get into housing, get into a safe place where they could thrive. Um, and too often, we don't act like there are sons and daughters on the street. We act like they're somebody else's. Um, I actually think that Measure H having passed by such an overwhelming margin, Measure HHH and the city having passed, uh, are a promising sign that maybe we are more acting like these are our people and our family members and, and part of humanity with us. Um, so I think it's very promising in, in that respect. I think when we talk about Measure H and we talk about ending homelessness or preventing homelessness, it's very important to go back to the sort of the basic of realizing what, is, what does it mean if someone is homeless? What it means is they do not have a home. And if you want to end homelessness for an individual, for a family, for a community, you have to figure out what are the long, what is the pathway for that individual, for that family, for that community to long-term stable housing. It doesn't look the same for everybody. It's different for different folks. We're all different, coming from different places and dealing with different things. But unless we answer that question, we are not really ending homelessness or preventing homelessness. Um, there's lots of what we do around homelessness. Most of what we do around homelessness is not calculated to end or prevent homelessness. And lots of it is very worth doing. I don't mean to suggest by that that there's not other stuff that's worth doing. But most of what we do is feed somebody or give them a place to sleep or send law enforcement out to deal with them. There's all host of things that may be necessary to do, that may be very humane to do, but unless they are calculated to put that person or that family on a pathway to long-term stable housing, we are not ending their homelessness. And I think when we think about this incredible resource that we have with Measure H in the county and Measure H, H, H in the city, collectively, those two measures over the next 10 years are $5 billion. Uh, that is not enough to end homelessness in LA County, but it is enough to make a huge difference in the lives of very many people. Um, it's really incumbent on us to answer the question I want to hear from the audience. What are the models out there? What are, we, what are we looking to for how we do this? How are we really measuring if we're making a difference and who's going to do that? We need to be making sure we're spending all of this money, as much of it as we possibly can, in a way that's calculated to either keep people in housing long term or get them into housing long term. For most people, that is a combination of housing and services. Some people need really robust housing support and not much in the way of services. Some people need a lot of services and not much in the way of housing. Some people need support for just a little while. Some people need it for long term. Again, it depends on where they're coming from and what they're dealing with. But it's almost always some combination of housing support and other services that people need. Um, and so I think it's important, um, I'll say this in a slightly different way, but I think it's important, so looking at these dollars, to not be distributing them to people who are dealing with homelessness, to entities that are confronting homelessness or having costs because of homelessness. We did not pass these measures in, in order to reimburse the people who are fighting a lot, dealing with a lot of homelessness and having a lot of costs associated with it. Either the people who are living on the street or the businesses or the governments or the nonprofits or whatever it is who are counting this and having problems with it. We put this money forward to help prevent and end homelessness. And we need to be asking that question about every dollar that's going out. Is it calculated to prevent homelessness for somebody or to end homelessness? So I think that's the frame we need to be looking at it through. So um, I said I was not going to talk a lot and more to go along, but I'll make three last quick points, hopefully. Um, hopefully quick. Um, some of which are related to Measure H, and some of which are more general about things that I think are coming up and things we need to focus on more. The first is already been alluded to, which is the issue of we need a lot more affordable housing. We are not going to solve our homelessness crisis in this county if we don't solve our affordable housing crisis, at least at the low end of the market. There's just no way we can do it. In the last 15 years, the median rent in LA County has gone up 28%. In the same period of time, the median rent of income has gone down by 8%. That, that combination of two numbers is more than any other reason why we have the homeless crisis we do. Uh, lots of other things are impacting it and relevant, but that number in and of itself, I think more than anything else, encapsulates so why we're in the situation we are. And we are not going to solve our affordable housing crisis unless every community in the county has more affordable housing. We are seeing way too much NIMBYism. I can come up, I'm a creative lawyer, I can come up with 10 reasons why any housing in any situation is a bad idea. We need to stop doing that and come up with 10 reasons why it's a good idea everywhere. And we all need to start doing that in our individual communities and insisting that our friends and neighbors and colleagues and others do the same. Um, last point I'll make, and then I'll let uh, Michelle pepper us with questions that I'd like to do it, um, is that um, 
I have generally pleased with how the measure of dollars are being distributed overall. There's lots of things. If I was in charge, people had to put me in charge of everything. I'm still waiting. Uh, but if I was in charge of lots of things, I'd do differently. But generally speaking, I think it is a reasonable approach. Lots of trade-offs and lots of things being balanced and lots of different things. But overall, I think it is a sensible first step for how we're focusing the dollars. I do think I would call out one area that I wish there was more focus on. I think we need to find other ways to focus on it. It is homelessness prevention. It is intervening with folks who are not yet homeless and helping keep them into their, into their housing. Um, the vast majority of the Measure H dollars, the vast majority of what we do around homelessness, is focused on helping people who are homeless. And there's lots of reasons for that and reasons why that makes sense, but I think we need to have more attention on the enormous number of people who are right on that cusp of falling into homelessness and what can we do to help bolster them and keep them in their housing rather than having them fall into the streets, onto the shelters, and then trying to confront the issue. Thank you. Thank you. What I would do is ask a couple of questions while people who wish to ask questions from the audience uh, line up right along here. Uh, so one of my questions has to do with the fact that I work for a, a nonprofit that does both housing, uh, affordable housing and housing of persons who are formerly homeless. And I found over this period of time, seven to eight years, uh, that we've been dealing with certain families and certain individuals, what I found was that uh, people basically went from emergency shelters into permanent supportive housing, into affordable housing, and then after a few years they fell off a cliff and they needed more supportive housing because they didn't know how to navigate the system anymore. Something happened in, in there and, and they wound up, families fell apart, people went uh, off in different directions, they, some of them wound up in uh, emergency shelters again. So what is in the funding that will allow for long term, and I mean decades, of uh, casework that can be done to assist families to stay together, to stay housed. So I'll, I'll say a couple things. Was, um, a couple things. First, you know, it's a 10-year funding screen for Measure H. Um, and as a result, there has been hesitancy already among law from law which is the LA Homeless Services Authority that coordinates a lot of the homelessness efforts in the county, um, to commit to long-term, for example, rental supports that go beyond that time period. So a lot of the rental supports that are being talked about are inherently and, and by design shorter than that. So not just the support of services, but the rental supports as well are shorter term than some people need. Um, I think the bright side on that front is the Measure HHH dollars, which are capital dollars and are designed to build predominantly permanent support housing. So at least on the, when you think about permanent support, you know, for the city of LA, that's correct, the limited city of LA, but it's 10,000 units in the city of LA is the plan. So it's very significant. You, when you think about permanent support housing, you basically have a three-part school, you need construction dollars to build it, you need rental subsidies, and you need um, support services of other sorts. And this is that first piece of it. It does not provide the other two pieces, but it is for long term. It's work some more to be there long term. Um, but we don't have a game plan for beyond the 10, 10, 10, 10 year mark, would be my short response to that. 10 years is a long time, and there's a lot we can do in that time, but we're going to need to figure out what the game plan is for beyond that, because um, lots of folks are still going to be And so, um, what's happening uh, I would have to add to that, I would have to add to that. That um, it's, it's just not a uh, affordable housing units that's being built. You know, when you when you look around the city, especially downtown, you know, all you see is cranes in the air. You know, and uh, developers is not investing into building housing for homeless because there's no property, there's no money into it. And so what happens is, like, I give you an example. Like me, my situation. Like 12 years ago, I was I was just now getting out of prison. And uh, I was homeless, and uh, I went to uh, 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 Southwest Army Harbor, like, I was 6th in uh, 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 Stanford. 
right? And I was there like maybe 60 days. And then from there, I went to go sign up at the Skill House and Trust Office. I think I got an apartment like in like, I think it was less than 60 or 90 days, right? But now, a person would go, you know, going through the same thing that I was just now getting out of, going through those same stages. <laughs> no telling when you're going to get an apartment, you know? And so I, I believe that, you know, uh, every door, because there's no resources, so many people that's on this. People go to you out. Every day we see people coming through our office asking, you know what to do this, you know how to go get this, you know what to do this. And I don't have answers. You know, there's nothing wrong. There's no resources. So people get fed up, they get tired. You know what I'm saying? We just quit to throw in the towel. You know, that's what makes a person go, I go to the liquor store, buy a beer or whatever it is, all the, the frustration and, and all the oppression, you know, and all the doors closing on you. That you just, you just, you just some people just can't take it. Some people just don't know how to fight, you know, that fight. And uh, another thing is, is that uh, 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 we we fought, and uh, uh, there was like some of the hotels that's uh, uh, that's downtown. I give example, the Cecil Hotel. You know, it's always been a, a poor person's hotel, and uh, uh, it's, it's, since gentrification downtown has come, the hotel has been sold by numerous uh, owners because every owner buy it, buys it with the, the idea of taking it and getting rid of the low income units and kick a hole in the wall and put the units together and sell them as lofts and condos, right? And so uh, what happened was we ended up uh, uh, talking to one of the owners, right, and finally got it and finally realized he wasn't going to do nothing with it but keep it a poor man's uh, hotel because of the hotel preservation artists that we had, one that I told you about earlier, right? And so uh, we uh, we told him, this, how many rooms here? 300, that's empty there. We say, okay, well, what do you want to do? He say, I want to fill them. So he was willing to fill up every last one of those rooms in the hotel with somebody that's off the block, that's homeless, right? And I mean, all the paperwork went through. I think you remember what this. All the paperwork went through, and people were signing on the dotted line, the county was going to finance it, and at the last minute, the business improvement district and along some of the developers pulled the plug, you know? And so um, right now, to this day, the hotel is still sitting empty. I don't think it's 15 residents in the building. Right now, here is a big old giant hotel. And so I think one of the things that people got to start doing is, you know, you got to, you know, if we're going to get over this homeless uh, a crisis, you know, then most definitely, you know, uh, the county going to have to put more protection. They're going to have to start forcing these business owners, forcing, you know, the people, the residents, let them know, hey, look, man, we're going to have to deal with it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's either, it's either the, the tents, you know what I'm saying, or you going to have to help finance these buildings, open up stuff and stuff like that. So for me, it's going to take more of that. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I agree with that. Um, in terms of long term after the 10 years, there really isn't much in there. The one thing I, I will say that uh, extended employment opportunities is a big deal in terms of pay, placing people in housing is one thing. Keeping, keeping them housed is um, determined on their employment in terms of being able to afford to live and continue to live there. And so one of the aspects under Measure 8 is to uh, extend employment opportunities to not just an eight-month period, but maybe 12, 15, or even 16 months, depending on the uh, on where they're at and the, the provider that's providing that service, uh, as well as trade training. And so there, with Triple H, there are capital dollars. There's going to be, um, there's going to be housing being built. But in order for people to stay in house, they need to be able to, uh, to be employed as well. And I think that that part will go uh, long term because those people will get the training they need, will be able to uh, uh, get employed for longer durations than just six or seven months, and be able to get themselves out their feet and, uh, and be able to pay their own bills, be able to pay their own um, uh, rent. And I think in terms of long term, I think that's one aspect that could be um, uh, considered long term past the 10 years. However, I, I agree. I mean, in terms of a, a 10 year uh, period, it's once it, the money's uh, dried up at that point, the, the voters are going to have to come back and, and pass another measure um, at that point. Uh, however, I, I think in the sense that measure, as Measure H gets rolled out, some of these pro, uh, services that are being funded in terms of job training could get expanded in terms of uh, how successful they are. And so uh, I'm, I'm with that in the sense that I, I feel like it's going, we're in, going the right direction. It's just a matter of making sure that were accountable for how this money is being spent appropriately. Um, and to the police 
police departments. Uh, and I compare that to the 85% cut in affordable housing dollars that Pasadena has had over the last few years. And that's, I think that's indicative of virtually every city that, that's trying to do affordable housing development. So uh, can, how controversial was the money going into the, the security uh, forces as compared with the safety net force of, of uh, trying to have affordable housing available? Uh, at the last meeting, there was a lot of discussion as to whether the sheriff's department should uh, be allocating that $1.2 million, uh, especially since they have a, a pretty large budget. And so it was it was basically argued that they have uh, task forces already uh, to combat homelessness, and they're very minimal. And so they do cover all of Valley County. And so to continue those task forces and expand those specifically just for homelessness, that money can only be utilized for that. So it is going into their budget, but then it was also equated to the point that the Department of uh, Health Services has a much bigger budget, and they're not getting allocated. Um, they're getting they're they are getting allocated uh, quite a bit of money uh, in proportion to the sheriff's department. So in terms of the law enforcement, it was contentious, but in the end, uh, board of supervisors thought that it was necessary that they continue the task forces to combat homelessness. Not to criminalize, but to help provide services through through them, and in conjunction with service providers. So this task force isn't just law enforcement. You have service providers, social workers on these courses to go out there and, and speak to homeless individuals to try and place them into either housing or get services to them or try and get them into recovery. So it, it, while it was controversial um, and it was a point of contention, um, I think in the end the board of supervisors unanimously saw that it was. Um, it was an issue that they still needed to be funded so that these forces could still go out there and do their jobs in placing people and not uh, just arresting them. Police going out and use the housing is a good tool. Uh, we don't believe that the police are social workers. They, 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 that ain't their job, that ain't what they do. Uh, we, know in our, we know in our community on, on Skid Row, uh, police, the police, well, Los Angeles period, LAPD receives 54% of the budget, right, already, right, and for the last 10 years, they've been having, since 2006, they've been having an initiative on Skid Row called the Second Cities Initiative. Just on their 10-year anniversary, they renamed it to Reset, but uh, it was, it brought in a, 110 extra cops, making it the most police community in the nation. And it was basically just to harass and target and gentrify homeless folks out of the downtown area. And they were spending over a hundred million dollars a year in the, the last ten years, right, on so-called social work, right? And so uh, uh, here it is, ten years they was average. They, they was averaging uh, uh, like uh, thirteen hundred tickets a, a month. And, uh, and, and over like 700 arrests a month, right? They, they, the policing was so crazy on Skid Row that Central Division of Police Station won the Media City Award for the worst police station in America from the National Law Center on Homeless and Poverty. But uh, nevertheless, the last, since 10 years, we told them, you cannot police your way out of homelessness. You can't do it. And the police ain't social workers. Uh, but the city continues to put money in the police. You know, police, money that's supposed to go to homeless, goes to the police. Out of a, the homeless budget, uh, it was a hundred million dollars. How much of that do you think went to the police? Eighty-three percent of it, you know, went to the police and the, the homeless. And so, uh, you know, moving forward, you know, uh, 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 money has to stop going to the police, you know, that's, that's intended for homelessness. Uh, I wrote a couple more uh, points now, I think I got one. But, um, but yeah, so we see police in other you know, police are not supposed to work with police are not supposed to be involved in this part of it. It's just money, that extra money that's going to be taken out. They already get fun for what, for the work that they do. Why should they get extra funds? The one piece that the committee of 50 that made recommendations could not reach a consensus on. Um, everything else they brought forward a consensus recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. Um, and from my perspective, it's a great illustration of the point I made earlier 
that these funds should be used for getting people into housing, keeping people in housing, what is calculated to have housing stability for folks. There is no doubt that our law enforcement has an enormous role and interaction with people who are homeless. And you, we can have lots of things about how they do that, and whether or not they do it well, and all those sorts of things. But there's no doubt they, they have enormous costs associated with that. But that is not what this money is designed to do. It's not to make those encounters more effective or more efficient or, or better. There's lots of ways we can do that and talk about what those encounters should look like. But this money is designed to get people into housing, to keep people into housing. And that is not what law enforcement is asked to do, what they're good at doing, or what this money should be used to do. So it was very controversial. It's only into over the age of 50, but it looks like at least one or two of you are. I admit I am. And I know that there was a time in my life, not too long ago, when I wasn't seeing all these homeless people. So what we're looking at, I, you know, I've been doing some reading about that because I want to understand why is it that we have 58,000 homeless people in Los Angeles tonight? When 40 years ago, maybe we had, does anybody know the number? 40 years ago, how many we had? I know one thing, it would have been hard to find them 40 years ago. Two people, right? 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 So, some, some of them were institutionalized, yes. We had some people who were mentally ill. But there was another time in this country's history where we had a similar problem. And this problem is tied to our economic cycles. The problem is not necessarily the people who end up being victims of the cycles. The problem is that we don't take charge and we allow the corporation, the corporations to control more than they should. In, the 19, in 1929, after the stock market crash, we had Hoover bills. Does anybody know about Hoover bills? I was reading about them. I mean, on the grounds of the White House, there were homeless encampments all over this country. But FDR came in many years later, and because of his plans, it changed everything around. All of that's being undone right now, and we're seeing the results of it. So we can talk about how law enforcement is going to combat homelessness. They're not. If I was not standing in church, I would use other language. Law enforcement is not designed to combat homelessness. That's not what they're there for. And this Measure H, I'm happy that we have this Band-Aid solution. But this is a problem that's going to require much more work. And I want to know, do any of you know if any real thought or plans have gone into looking at the real drivers of homelessness and not just looking at the homeless as if they're the problem? Because they're the victims of a much deeper problem. Uh, when you look at the city of Los Angeles, right, uh, they continue to try to criminalize, police their way out of homelessness. Uh, even after when they declared a homeless state of emergency, Mayor Garcetti and Western Council members declared a homeless state of emergency in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, uh, I was at the press conference, and uh, 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 they said from this day on, uh, we're going to stop the criminalization and we're going to move toward housing. Right? And I remember I shouted out and I asked Wes and I said, uh, well, where's Chief Beck at? And it was like, it ain't about Chief Beck. We run this. I said, yes, it is, because you need to tell him, because he's on the scare road right now, arresting all these people as he's having his press conference going on. Right? And so from that point, they said that they was going to create a homeless ad hoc committee inside City Hall to address all these issues. Right? And I went to every last one of their meetings that they had the first year. Like every bit of like 17 meetings. And every 17 meetings they talked about criminalization. Right? Every meeting. Now, one meeting that they had where they talking about bringing a bottle of water out to somebody on the street, sitting down, talking to somebody on the street, and really figuring out how to work this homeless issue out. Right? In fact, last year the city of Los Angeles passed five new anti homeless laws. Right? Uh, around 50, 60, 11, around closing parks, around how much property you can have, your property got all fit in a 60 gallon trash can. The, the, the last day of City Hall, the last day of work, before they closed the door and ran out for Christmas vacation, they passed a homeless law that said a homeless man cannot sleep in his car. 85. That was the last thing they did, then they ran out.
out the front door to go to a uh, Christmas vacation with their family. This is the kind of stuff that got to stop. That's what got to stop. You know, the money got to go to really house people. Doc, I mean, reading the price of housing is just skyrocketing. I mean, that is probably the biggest factor. So, we are looking at that. The problem is we need to find a way to get those prices down to have affordable housing for someone who's working three jobs to be able to afford housing. It is a travesty that someone, uh, uh, a single mother, has to work three jobs and has to live in shelters with their, with their kids. And I think that's probably the biggest driver uh, in terms of homelessness. And it could overtake how many people we, uh, we could get housed if uh, the median prices continue to rise. So as many people as we can find housing and services for, may not matter if we can't find a way to find <laughs> affordable housing for those who are on the verge of becoming homeless. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's probably the biggest issue. And um, uh, you know, Adam alluded to that earlier. It, it is, it is big. It's a big deal. So Triple H uh, is probably one of the biggest um, things to pass because they're going to be able to build uh, these homes in LA. And you know, ten thousand units is ten thousand units. We need to be able to build more of that. And so, as part of our, what our homeless community is looking at is being able to find other places in other cities that are going to be able to house people. Finding those. Uh, areas like motels that he was speaking about, and using those motels, developing into housing for them. You know, we can't just say that this is a bad idea, not in my backyard. You know, I'm looking at this as yes, yes, in my backyard, and this is why we need to do it. And so, I think in terms of uh, affordable housing, it's the biggest issue by far. The question was pretty big, um, and we could probably spend days grappling with many aspects of it. Just a couple quick comments. The first is in addition to affordable housing. The other side of the equation is poverty. Um, and it's those two things together that are really driving into homelessness. So anything you can do to bring up people's incomes, and there's lots of different strategies for that, um, but not enough attention to put on that either. Um, the other thing I just mentioned is there is some, some good work and creative work being done looking at the specific folks who are becoming homeless and what are their pathways into homelessness, and are there institutions that they are passing through that should be different. So for example, enormous number of the kids who are, or young people who are homeless, have come through our foster care system. Uh, an enormous number of people, as Jeff Rowan suggests, who are on the streets have come through our criminal justice system. Right? We have a number of institutions that are essentially sending people out of those institutions and into homelessness or into situations where they are quickly becoming homeless. And the military is another one. So we're coming out of the military and Street. So we need to figure out from an institutional perspective what do we need to do differently, both at the time of discharge and beyond that in terms of wrapping around services and supporting folks so that they're not ending up on the streets. So one of the fascinating things about homelessness and one of the reasons I enjoy working in this area is because it, is, it literally touches on everything. Um, and there's just one other example. 39% of people who are homeless tonight in LA County are African American. 9% um, of people who live in the county are African American. You cannot explain that difference through poverty. I mean, so there's all sorts of really sort of the essence of who we are as a, as a culture, as a society, it's embedded in this question of who's ending up on our streets, why are we allowing this to happen, why aren't we being more aggressive, and what do we need to do to change it? So there's just so many facets to this. There isn't, anybody who tells you that there's a simple solution that we have to do X is kidding you. Um, there are definitely things that are significant that we have to do that will make a big difference, but there's lots of aspects to it that we need to tackle. Um, and a lot of it comes down to the shredding of the social, social safety net and the economic safety net that's gone over or overlooked you know, since the 1980s. Um, we have people who, when they, when they fall into homelessness or when they fall into poverty, they don't have a social safety net to support them in the same way they did at once in, in the past in this country. And that's only getting worse from the federal level. I'd like to add to this and not repeat uh, what others have said, although I endorse it, is that <coughs> Uh, the way we approach housing is another one of those things that uh, we need to correct. Uh, I heard, I think it was Christian, talk about how you have to go through certain steps in order to get into housing. Well, there's what's called a housing first model, which means that you just take people where they are, you house them, you bring the services to them. And unless and until we really adopt that kind of approach, we're going to have people who are still trying to qualify for housing. The other thing is trying to fund housing. We typically pass 
measures and uh, bond measures and other kinds of things. And that means that our, the availability of funds go up and down. Uh, whereas if we had some kind of general fund allocation for affordable housing or housing in general, uh, we then would have a source of funding always available. Uh, we need another approach to how we're going to fund people's ability to stay uh, and have housing security. Because we're not just talking about adults. We have generations of children who grow up homeless. And that's just criminal. You touched on the fact that the committee of 50, I understand Mark Lee Thomas is the only black man on that committee. When he steps away from the table, there are no black men represented at that table. When you say 40% of the homeless are African Americans, uh, that's a huge number. So we need to find a way to advocate to get either a member of your organization or somebody that will represent that issue on that committee. You know, drop somebody, kick somebody to the curb, don't make it 51. I mean, definitive, definitively say this is needed. Secondly, when we talk about the safety net, we already know our current administration is doing everything they can to shred that safety net. I think the, the HUD people, everybody's removing money from the pool. How is that? Are we considering how that potentiality is going to affect how we then allocate that money? You know, it's a big unknown what's going to happen on the federal level. And, and it definitely is going to impact how these dollars should be allocated, depending on what dries up. And my concern about it is that we may end up using these dollars to just fill holes. Yeah. Right? And, and not to be, and we, need to, we may need to do that, because there may be things that we have to do with it. But um, we may be using this money to stand still to some degree over the long run if the federal cuts end up being as bad as some are threatening to happen to be. I agree with you talking about we need community representation on the oversight of committees. Uh, and I gave an example of that. Uh, on the Triple H on the city, Jose Weasel was a council member of our district, just appointed Blair Burstein, right, who's uh, one of the directors of the Historic Core Business Improvement District. Yeah. 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 Now, that's, if that ain't putting the wolf over to guard the chicken coop, I don't know where it is. Right? And so, I mean, just the history, we just won a lawsuit last month against one of the downtown business and business, business improvement districts that was in collaboration with the city, you know, for uh, illegally confiscating and destroying homeless people's property. Matter of fact, our organization was founded on one of the lawsuits, you know, 17 years ago, you know, pursuing the business improvement district for the same practice. You know, and so here it is, we got council members, you know, there me that unknowingly, you know, put these gentrifiers, you know, there me on these oversight committees. So we want to start holding these elected officials accountable, you know, in a serious way. You know, so that's one thing to uh, We have to hold them accountable. Um, in terms of uh, accurate representation around the, the planning group, um, I attended the meetings, and there, there were um, uh, a good blend of people um, from all walks of life, service providers, but there was also people with uh, lived experience. And so I think in, in the sense that there was a, a back and forth within the planning group, uh, the most vocal were the people with the lived experience. And so I think as if the planning group gets reconvened in the next few years, there's going to be a really good representation from the community. But um, I also agree that we need more people that understand what's happening on the street level, people like the general, people who understand this. Um, and I think that's something that we can all advocate for as we move forward. I come from Whittier, we have a small footprint type of solution for shelter homelessness, but overcoming NIMBYism and the resistance of the housing industry, uh, the, the built-in resistance to 200, 400 square, uh, 600 square foot tiny home footprints, whether they're courtyards, whether they're SROs, our industry resisted and then the neighbors resist it because they fear it won't be a good neighbor. A humble neighbor is not a good neighbor, but there almost needs to be a strategy, perhaps, that I posit this and going, who's going to do it? And I make the idea that I have to do it. A, a good neighbor policy says a humble neighbor can be a good neighbor, and that to overcome the, the zoning problem we have, because it's a zoning problem. Before World War II, we had railroad hotels downtown. The legacy of SRO housing and Skid Row housing trust are those great old railroad hotels that employed people 100 years that uh, railroad people lived in. Those are rehabbed with social services. In the suburbs in the post-war period, 
our zoning doesn't allow for any kind of density like that. Whittier lost two. We had a, a boarding house, and we lost a, what was a small railroad hotel. And they were scraped off because the land value is too great. And of course, the current owner won't build that way, plus the zoning is prohibitive. But it's how do you overcome the resistance, the strategic resistance toward investment, and whether it's accessory dwelling units, which is the jargon we use in the design profession, the secondary unit, up zoning, so that you can have a secondary unit in county property, like in Whittier, or you have uh, 200 square foot SROs with a bathroom and kitchen down the hall, that makes it affordable, because that's the only way you're gonna make it affordable. Land is too expensive, and right now, the investors who build housing, it's a very conservative business. That's not a bad word, but they're, they're risk averse. And you're overcoming the political resistance and saying, well, a humble neighbor can be a good neighbor. Otherwise, it is centralized downtown. And that's what we've done for decades. We centralize it downtown. The suburbs would need to take it up. I had a chance to talk with the outgoing supervisor, Don Kanabi, before um, he was turned out. And I was saying, Don, I mean, the county has to rezone. I mean, we're up against the wall. Because little by little, even in central core Whittier, the land value is so great that a single family dwelling will rapidly be at a million dollars, which is unaffordable. We're struggling just getting middle class housing on the old Nellis, uh, Nellis uh, Youth Authority site toward $300,000, $400,000 units. And the city people are going crazy because they say, well, it's going to be a slump. So there's a political piece and a promotional piece to overcome the resistance. And then the political piece to up zone and down zone so that you can have higher density and that a humble neighbor is not necessarily a bad neighbor. Somehow we did this before World War II, but we lost our way in the way we designed and built in the communities. And that's the big piece of it for me. Otherwise, it's really just going to be an exercise of containment and management. And one more time, it's doomed to fail. Containment and management is not the answer. But some of this money probably needs to go into changing the way people think about a small footprint neighbor. Vera Fleshman, who worked at SRO Housing, was able to flip some of those hotels and build infill density, high density housing, but it's in a footprint area in Central City East, where you're working, sir. And so the resistance wasn't as great. But it's still, it's contained. You can't cross the million dollar hotel, won't get changed. Beyond your zone, Fifth Street, in that district, you won't be able to get more of it built. It's the county has the resistance to zoning up something. Tiny footprints, minimum footprints, but then how do you politically get people to see that the humble neighbor is not a bad neighbor? And that's going to be the trick. I'm not sure what the answer is. Otherwise, it's another exercise in containment and management. And in reality, if you see some of the things that have been built, some of the permits for it out that's already been built, there's nothing like that. Um, I would love to live in some of these places. These places are amazing. They're designed so that people can continue to be retained. And they're not bringing property values down, they're bringing them up, if anything. When you have a slump hotel that's going to be redeveloped into housing, that's going to bring these property values up, and people get that and understand that, then you, that resistance starts to wave, go away. But the point is education. And they don't even know what that actually means. And that, that's, a big, that's a big issue. That is one piece of what we want to do with our coordinator is not just to find service providers, but to educate communities at sites, at our potential sites for, uh, for housing, and saying this is what it is. Visit these other properties that you could actually see physically how they're being conducted, how the community is thriving, and in that way I think we can make some headway. But it really does come out to political pressure, redoing the zoning, and providing a lot more of an educational uh, background to what it actually does. It degrees education. Uh, to answer your question, in, in downtown LA, uh, we call it the W divide, right? Because clearly there is a line between the haves and the have-nots, and you can clearly see it, right? If you the being Main Street being the divide, if you east of Main Street, you got Skid Row, right? It's nothing there. We did an 18-month campaign in Wazar's office just to bring basic things like trash cans to Skid Row, right? But then when you go to the other side, you go over there. Don't even go over there by LA Live. You know, it's never gonna like you walking in heaven somewhere. You know, and you know, and so I mean, it's a clear. You, 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 I mean, it's like the, the other side don't want to be associated, don't want to be a part of this. It's like they're in their own world. You know, and so yeah, it's we have to break that. You know, I mean, education gonna be some of it. It's it's a lot of racism. It's a whole lot of a whole lot of stuff. You know, what I'm saying we that's, that's going there. And what's what's crazy about.
about it, is the city is promoting the whole lot. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, the city is the main driving force. You know what I'm saying? It's pushing it. And so, uh, folks, there. Um, there's a study that just came out, uh, I think, last week that both LA Canada and the city of Los Angeles are involved with looking at the availability or lack of availability of restrooms on State Row. About 1,800 people um, on the streets of State Row each night, um, nine functioning bathrooms on the average night. Uh, they don't even come close to meeting the standard that a UN refugee camp uh, would have for bathrooms on State Row. So lots of issues that need to be dealt with on that. On your question about affordable housing, the point about affordable housing and the need for more affordable housing, I'd say three things. First, I'd say there are a number of studies that are increasingly coming out showing the um, the effect of affordable housing on neighborhood property values that are generally very helpful for the idea that we want affordable housing in our neighborhoods. So generally finding they tend to bring up the property values in neighborhoods. Um, so there's some, some go back to the education point and sort of getting out information about those studies. Most of them out of New York, um, but a few other places as well. Um, secondly, I actually disagree. I don't think it's a problem with developers. I think it's a problem with political will. I agree with your political will point, but I think that's where the problem is. I think the elected officials are responding to their constituents. And we need many more voices and much stronger voices advocating for the sorts of things that you're saying we need more of. We're going to have to have a more dense county if we are going to have more affordable housing. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to have density everywhere of every sort, but everybody has an idea, again, for why it shouldn't be dense in my neighborhood in that way. And people aren't coming forward and saying, well, we could have more density here if we did it this way. You know, whether that's granny flats or zoning differently or whatever it might be. So we just need a lot more people standing up and saying, I'm willing to have more density, I'm willing to have more people in subsidized housing in my neighborhood, um, let's make this happen. And if their elected officials are hearing that from their constituents, the developers will follow um, in a way that they're not following currently, I think. In the court, you could have courtyard cottages. There's I mean, lots of possibilities yeah. to lack of political will. Yeah. And I think that part of that political will has to be with the uh, the Board of Supervisors, they must start to model the behavior they expect of their uh, citizen uh, voters. Uh, the Golden Motel is a hotel, a motel in uh, right outside of Temple City where, you know, we had the opportunity of taking a very troubled piece of property and turning it into really good housing and uh, the supervisor, uh, she's new to the job, but she says that she really supports affordable and affordable housing and housing for uh, homeless individuals, but she didn't step up and say that out loud and support the, uh, the program. Now they withdrew the application. So, you know, we need, we need them to model some behavior that uh, the rest of the Community can look up to. Uh, I agree, I'd love to see that leadership from them, but that's not going to happen unless we demand it, right? I mean, even Jose Rizar in the city of LA, who chaired the Measure HHH committee and raised a lot of money for it, he's opposing the development of Royal Heights in this district that, that a lot of people are supporting. I mean, it's a great project run by a great organization. It's almost universal that when, when there's more affordable housing, people in that neighborhood are opposing it. It's true in the low-income neighborhoods, it's true in the wealthy neighborhoods, it's true everything in between. You try to put affordable housing in there and people are opposing it. Unless that changes, unless we change that and our neighbors and colleagues and families change that, the political leaders are following our lead on this. And we're not insisting they do it. We're saying we want it, and then the specific project comes in and we say, oh yeah, but not here, not that one. We give you 10 reasons that one's a bad idea. Unless that changes, I just don't think we're going to get, I, I think those thinkers, they're not, they're not brave enough or foolish enough from a political standpoint to step up on it. I don't think we're going to see it. There is a petition that's going, or a yes. survey that's going around asking people what kinds of things you would like to do, meeting with her, working on second units, working on a whole bunch of things. All those things are available. So if Good. you want to do that, please sign up and we will get back to you. Okay. That, that's absolutely correct. I think in terms of political will, it's not so much that I support these projects. It's they have to get out in front and say, I want your input from the community, but this project is going to happen in my district. That's what they have to do. And that's the only way things are going to get done, is that they say it's going to happen. We want your help. It's OK if you don't want to help us, but it's going to happen. And that's what needs to happen with these political uh, uh, yeah, My name is Ted Moore, also from Whittier. And uh, I had worked on 
at Skid Row for five years at SRO Housing. I was asked by my church to open up a homeless shelter in Whittier, so 15 years there. Um, one of the things that I think you need politically is constituent will. Because constituent will will also drive. In Whittier, we had a lot of Indianism. Today, we have Yimby. Yes, in my backyard. We were the Center for Nonprofit Management. I actually did a two-year impact study in the city, and we did reduce the fear by 85 percent. And one of the things that I noticed, I looked at the individuals who were out in cabinets, and I noticed that they had one thing that is part of the solution that no one's focusing on. They have community. There is community that are on the streets. People take care of each other. Housing first is a lot of things, and then you have some caseworker comes around once a week. But that person's there alone. There is no community. You've got to put community at the end of the whole process. So people come into a helpful, viable community. The, uh, I think that's so important. And uh, the other thing that's important is not only looking at dollars and politics and the politicians, but social capital is really developing the social capital. All these cities have advocated the responsibility over to both the government and LA. So let's send it down to LA. But what happens is that once you find out that people find their success with people becoming homeless in their local community, they become very supportive and become real advocates for it. So the social capital, will give you two examples that are happening now. Uh, we just came from our church, which did family promises, which is uh, working three jobs, a family, and we're there helping to support them you know, while they go through a family solutions process in another city, hoping to get that agency there. Also, Imagine LA is another creative thing. For Imagine LA, we're going to have the first offshoot in Whittier, in Los Angeles, called Imagine Whittier, where every family that is housed will have one mentor for every person in the household. Because that's the stuff afterwards. Um, 30 year recovering alcoholic, I have a sponsor. I need a sponsor. Everyone that's homeless needs someone else to be with them, shepherd them, and help them, especially organizing formerly homeless people to really get involved and help people through the process. So the whole social component that is really not being addressed in these kinds of initiatives. And uh, I think some of the churches now are really willing to step up, but it's definitely not organized. And uh, it's eclectic. So I just want to put social capital on that. Or it's a walk around the neighborhood and talk about a lot of the issues that are going on in the city row. And the single most frequent comment I get when people come back to the office and we sit and talk is their surprise of a community there is. Um, it, it's a neighborhood where people know each other, people are looking out for each other, people are living together as people do when they live next to each other. That's not how people see folks who are homeless. Right? They see them too often as the other, as somebody different, as somebody, right? Um, and until we get back to realizing these are human beings, and they're us, um, and they're interacting with the people who are in the tent right next to them, or who are living on the building behind them, or you know whoever it is, or they're they're on the phone with their sister, or you know whatever. I mean, they're 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 living their lives and they're going about it. And wherever the solution is, has to have a robust community that they're a part of. Um, it's striking to me how many people who are almost on Skid Row who, when they get into housing, want to stay in that community. There are lots of people who are eager to get out and go someplace else, but there's also a lot of people who see that as that's their home. Right, that's that's where they know people. That's where their support network is. That's where the people they're friends with are. And and so on Skid Row, right? You know, often on the block they're on, right? Yeah. Is, right. So we need to recognize that you're absolutely right. That's part of the of the solution. Whatever the housing support is, at the end of the rainbow, that's that's if that's steady and that's some some place they can stay. It's got to have a community aspect to it. Well, since we're talking about constituent will, I'm trying to get. Uh, people to put pressure or lack to have, of well lack of or yeah. get people to have, put pressure on their elected officials to have more housing in their neighborhoods. Uh, I just went through a this is a very small uh, example, but uh, in Los Feliz, which is a neighborhood I live in in Los Angeles, um, there, there's a, a proposal to build a, a 150, 180 unit uh, building on a certain intersection uh, that was a designed to have 16 units of affordable housing. And there was a lot of uh, NIMBY pressure uh, with the neighborhood council. They spent uh, six different sessions, six, six separate sessions, discussing this and going back and forth in terms of what their recommendation would be. There were advocates for 
you know, for, for that project to be built as well. I, I think I said 16 units, uh, which would be about 20% uh, of the total. Uh, half of the, they were totally split. Half of the, half of the neighborhood council said uh, they didn't want the project at all. It was too big, it didn't fit with the neighborhood, it would perhaps cause traffic problems, or there would be they want environmental impact studies. Uh, it didn't, you know, they needed it, it was only exceptions to build it, which were, is part of the deal, you know, that if you put affordable housing, you, you can apply for these exceptions. Uh, the other half were saying, no, we don't want to build it unless they put more affordable housing in it. So that was finally the, 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 uh, the position that prevailed, uh, 97, uh, was uh, let's go ahead and recommend approval, but have 22 units of affordable housing instead of 16. Uh, but it was a very close, yeah, I, you know, I advocated for that and others came out, you know, to kind of oppose the reflexive nimbyism. That, that things are starting to change with defeating Measure S and, you know, supporting JJJ and, and the, the, uh, the uh, homelessness to homelessness initiative. So I do think there's a, starting to be a change. But this, of course, this, this commission doesn't have any, this neighborhood council doesn't have any power. It's the planning commission and the city council member that will eventually you know, move it forward. But anyway, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about some loose ends. I didn't hear anyone talk about uh, Airbnb, and I was wondering if that's an issue, taking, taking units off the market that should be there, used to be there for, you know, a short-term solution for people that provide a safety valve for, for, for people that otherwise would find themselves on the street. And is that a problem? And if so, what are we doing about that, you know? To get those those units back on, on you know, available to people in the community, uh, and the second question is, um, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, all the hoops that people that, that people can't just get into housing, right, and uh, that they have to go through various stages to sort of prove their eligibility, and that might be, I guess, you know, getting, uh, you know, not being getting off of uh, their alcohol or drug addictions, for example or showing they can keep a steady job and this kind of thing. And, uh, but you mentioned the housing first as a uh, model. And I'm wondering, because I would definitely favor that, uh, you know, how can we, housing is a right. You know, we have 50,000 people on the street, so they shouldn't be there. We should be, they should be in apartments or homes of some kind, you know, they should be off the street. So how do we move to, what is being done to move to the housing first model specifically? You know, has adopted a housing first model approach and uh, we were able, to, within seven years, to reduce the uh, homelessness count from about 1,200 to what's now 575. Uh, but we also had available at that time a federal government that was adding money and assisting on this. So I don't know how this, the next few years will play themselves out. Uh, but I know that uh, the community has kind of accepted the approach, and it's something that the nonprofits, especially, uh, have bought into. We have a central intake system that basically identifies the people who are most vulnerable on the streets and does its best to get them into housing immediately and not uh, go through transitional housing or whatever. And then you eventually wind up in uh, a permanent supportive uh, system. But I think it took the leadership of people like uh, Bill Long, who's head of the housing department, as well as uh, his assistant, uh, Ann Lansing, who is just steeped in all of the best practices and all the rest of these things. And she acts as very much of a technical assistant to anybody who, who's a technical to do this. Uh, Pasadena is not LA, of course. It's much smaller and more, much more hands-on. So I think that's one difference, at least. So on the housing first, I, I think, at least in LA, I think we are reading a largely one that bad. I think most people are on board with the idea that that needs to be the approach. There's still lots of nuance to whether people are actually doing it, in what settings, how they're doing it. I think the challenge at the moment is just not enough housing. So you've got, you've got all sorts of mechanisms for trying to prioritize who's going to get it and hopes people have to jump through that might or might not eventually get them to the front of the line. So there's still a big process that feels a bit like the old system. 
But I think people are aware that our house will be gotten to get people in as quickly as possible. And that's the best practice. So I think that's increasingly come to be seen as after OC in LA. What was your program? Yeah, I'm trying Airbnb, to. The Airbnb. Oh, the Airbnb. Yeah. So, um, so Airbnb, there's a bill that I'm not, uh, a proposal in the city of LA. I don't know if you're tracking it. Um, in the city of LA, um, I don't know where it stands, but basically, as I understand it, it's trying to do two things. One is to restrict um, Airbnb, this is just the city of LA, but to restrict Airbnb to just being uh, rentals in home, from homes that are occupied. So they're trying to get rid of the situation where somebody goes out and buys a bunch of homes and then has them full time be uh, for this model. Rather, it's people who have homes and they so they're limiting for, I don't know what the number is, but it's like you know, 100 days a year or something. Uh, so that's one thing that's kind of restricted that way. And the other is to put some sort of tax on it that then generate money for affordable housing. So I think those have been the two sort of points that people have focused on, at least to the extent I've heard from the conversation. But I don't know quite where it stands in terms of where in the process or how likely it is, or if there are other issues I'm less aware of. So it is a problem that it's taking, causing off the market? Yes, I think nobody quite knows how much, but yes. So we're putting together our panel session for 2027 on homelessness. Measure it, measure age, 10 years on. You guys have all have devoted big parts of your life to this. Is the kicker going to be why measure? What's the main reason measure age absolutely failed and we still have 80,000 people on the streets? Or what changed about society in Los Angeles that we've got 5,000 people on the streets? So what was the question again? What are we going to think of Measure H 10 years from now? Was it a success? Well, most definitely, uh, no matter which way it go, right? Measure, it's not enough money to, to be a complete success. I mean, let's face it. I mean, this is not the end all solution to homelessness, right? Uh, quite sure it's going to take a bite out of it, you know, but there's a lot of work that's still got to be done. You know, the city has to continue to invest, the county has to see continue to invest. Developers are going to have to start kicking in some property. You know, there may be folks that got property going to kick in property. Right? So it's still a long, long, long way to go. But I would say Measure H and Triple H is probably two of the biggest things that the city and the county has done toward homelessness in a long time. You know what I'm saying? So I'll give them that much. Even though it was voters, they, they dumped it in the way on voters, you know, especially the city. Because uh, the majority of their money they put in give it to the police and the police don't. Right? And so uh, um, I think it'll, it'll be great. You know, if, if the oversight is there, uh, I, I think it has potential to work out. But it's got to be continued funding. Um, no, I would agree. I think it's, it's definitely not enough money to, uh, to solve the problem. But I think in the end it's going to be successful. I think it's going to limit how uh, um, many homeless are out there on a given night. Uh, but we still have to go much further. I think every year we have to go back and understand what's worked, what hasn't worked, and reappropriate and reappropriate those funds, you know, properly. So that programs that are working need to get funded more money. Programs that are working need to be defunded, and that money needs to be moved. And I think um, as this is going to be rolled out and as time goes on, I think that is what's going to happen, and I think it's going to be successful in the sense that it is going to take a bite out of homelessness. Um, and I really hope it doesn't take a really big bite. You know, I just don't want to see a lot of money go to like a lot of salaries. You know, people are supposed to be creating programs. You know, and money going to the police. Because then we have a problem. So I think we'll look back and think of it as a very successful program. I'm hopeful that we'll look back and look at it as a very successful program that helps um, move a lot of people off the streets, out of shelters, into housing, and help support them to stay in that. I think the question of what our homelessness landscape will look like 10 years from now um, is not all that dependent on Measure H and how it's used up. I think there are broader issues about what's going on with the federal government, what's going on with our affordable housing market, what's going on with poverty in Los Angeles, what's going on with the production of affordable housing, and the communities and the issues we're talking about, and all those sorts of things. If we don't figure those out, even with Measure H, we're going to be in trouble 10 years from now. If we figure those out, the measure H is going to be seen as a you know, significant piece of a much larger set of things that help solve the issue. Um, 10,000 people become homeless every night in LA, every month in LA County. 10,000 people come into homelessness. So there's just no way with the, with the resources we're talking about with Measure H, we're going to be able to solve that. Um, it's going to make a big difference, but we've got to do other things to solve the problems. 
So all three of you are invited back 10 years from now, a little grayer, and we're going to hold you to your optimism. Okay. That's good. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the